The following is a presentation of TFNN. The Trader's Edge with Steve Rhodes. Call now, toll free at 1-877-927-6648 or internationally at 727-873-7618. The Trader's Edge. Now, Steve Rhodes. Steve Rhodes? More like Jacob Shoup, am I right? What's going on, everyone? Interesting day in the market. We have the dollar break topside well above that magic level that Tom talks about. We're at 105. 14, but the ES, the, the SPX futures have also gone up. And we're nearing kind of a yearly high on the futures there. The yearly high is at 46.34. Of course, we still have a long way to go currently at uh, 45.48, um, but quite the recovery uh, from earlier this year. And so what's up with the divergence? Usually when the dollar goes higher, you get the futures going lower. And I think what we're seeing here regarding this um, is that even though CPI wasn't phenomenal yesterday, now there was core CPI. Core CPI wasn't, uh, wasn't too bad. And so I think what the market's looking at is there's not going to be many more rate hikes currently, right? I, there probably will still be some kind of uh, hawkish position from the feds. At least in September, they're not looking to raise rates any further. And uh, we might have rates just be a little bit sticky for the next uh, year or something like that. As it stands now, that seemed to be a positive sentiment uh, for the uh, SPX futures. So interesting. RTY up 1.47, NQ up 0.84, uh, YM Dow futures 0.64%. Gold um, getting hit a little bit with that dollar popping up, but still trading at 931. We're sideways today. Uh, silver 2291 down. Copper has made. Uh, huge bump today nice little rally at, uh let's see here contract trading at 382 right now so there was another one they were speaking about in the den this is tgb they're kind of like a mid-tier copper miner uh Tosico mines of uh, sub 18 percent today huge huge amount of volume uh on this gap up um what's occurring with this is china they're they're going kind of through a deflationary situation and they're decreasing the amount of reserve uh, funds that are uh, needed to be held. Um, so that frees up some cash for them. And uh, that was pretty bullish for copper. So that's that with the news uh, regarding the metals there. Uh, Lightspeed crude contract at 90 right now, still moving pretty high. Brent crude at 93.48. Steel Dynamics, 100. Tesla, we'll talk about them a little bit. Still moving pretty strong right now, one point. 6.4%. We have the Qs, 0.89. Google doing all right. Meta doing all right. Disney face palming at 83 bucks still. And Apple at 175.71. Again, it seemed that their iPhone 15 release uh, wasn't, uh, didn't have the intended effect that they wanted. They also released a, uh, how do you call it? Like, a, like I, guess, I guess an advertisement in some way, but it was more a, a public service announcement. Um, that a lot of the internet found pretty cringy. Um, I guess the goal is noble. They're trying to go um, plastic free. Um, a lot of their uh, plants and offices are carbon neutral. Um, but I think the way that they decided to kind of convey that to everyone um, kind of made them, uh, it was a little bit embarrassing. Uh, however, that's not obviously impacting their stock uh, in any means. One of the big pieces of news today is Arm Holdings is public. Um, so they're a British semiconductor uh, manufacturer and design company. This is going to be really interesting. You know, TSMC kind of investing them a little bit. This is a big move by SoftBank to put them out there. Um, but it'd be interesting to see how the West kind of rebounds now with uh, production of semiconductors as we're kind of deinvesting out of Taiwan due to some geopolitical uh, conflict that arises from China. Um, it's very funny because this kind of hit China relatively hard. Obviously, they've made some breakthrough recently with their semiconductors. Um, but I saw a funny bit of news, and it's not, again, really tied to finance, but more just geopolitical economics. But um, 
the U.S. State Department uh, called China's, excuse me, let me mute my computer here, uh, called China's quote-unquote ban on the iPhone overreaction, which I find funny be, since we kind of are stemming off the flow of semiconductors, which is obviously far more integral uh, to any kind of development. In one second, we got a DM here. All right. What else are we looking at today? I wanted to pull something else out, but got distracted there. Ah, yes, yes. We've been speaking of crypto a little bit too, and it's kind of integration into you know, the traditional markets. Um, it's obviously crashed pretty heavily um, due to some conversation in G20 about a global uh, kind of regulatory body for it or regulatory rules, but Deutsche Bank is actually gonna start holding crypto for institutional clients. Um, so we'll look here. I got another DM. We'll get to that soon here after I run through this. And uh, I think this is pretty interesting because um, you, you get all these these younger bankers, right? Maybe they're like uh, they're fresh out of like Wharton or Harvard or something like that. Uh, even the MIT guys are big on this. And crypto has been treated a lot like game theory with these guys. And I would assume probably a lot in like private equity is treated that way as well. Um, in some investment courses that I had in college, we had run through game theory um, regarding, you know, diversification of portfolio um, and kind of things along those lines. Uh, so adding crypto to it, even if the fundamentals aren't really there, um, in essence, uh, the price movements are real and uh, the hype around it is real as well. So Deutsche Bank is partnering with Swiss crypto firm Taurus uh, to provide custody services for institutional clients, cryptocurrencies, and tokenized assets. Uh, the partnership means Deutsche Bank will, for the first time, be able to hold a limited number of cryptocurrencies for its clients, as well as tokenized versions of traditional financial assets. That's and this is. We can talk more about this at a later date, maybe tomorrow, and I can write up a little bit on it and get all the information that you guys deserve out here on the tokenization of traditional financial assets. Uh, but very interesting kind of move, um, and I love this new like voodoo finance that they're doing with it. Um, the crypto trader uh, trading is not the bank's immediate plans, they said, uh, but they're aiming to offer this, um, or excuse me, we're um, positing offering this, um, the WEF in 2020. And uh, a tidbit for the crypto markets, they've struggled to recover from last year's series of collapses at top crypto firms. And this left investors with large losses and prompted lawmakers around the world to call for more regulation. Ethereum is also um, dealing with some regulatory issues right now as well, and the uh, founder of Ethereum uh, has released a little bit of a uh, conversation on that today. He says cooler heads will prevail, um, but we're talking about competing with global financial institutions. So we'll see how that goes for him. Uh, I still think out of all of it, Ethereum is probably the most um, forward thinking with their proof of stake as opposed to proof of work. Proof of stake, you know, you still have large um, whales, as they call them, so people who hold a lot of the uh, float of crypto, they're obviously going to get more from it. But the issue that you run into with this proof of proof of work concept, where you're solving hash algorithms to create new blocks and therefore new Bitcoin, is that uh, it wasn't very equal, right? And what I mean by that is you had large institutions, uh, you had large just entities in general, even criminal enterprises, who were able to invest a lot of money into the hardware in order to craft these hashes and get more crypto. So at the end of the day, uh, you, you, you still had a lot of assets developing at the top. Folks, stay tuned, we'll be right back. Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30 plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen, as well as many more. And he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30 year T-bonds as they both influence Forex markets tremendously. When you sign up for the Tiger Forex Report, you also gain instant access to Teddy's 60-minute webinar archive he just hosted, Forex Strategies and Fundamentals, What is Behind the Tiger Forex Report. For all the details and to start your 30-day Tiger Forex Report subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. 
You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the Opening Call newsletter at TFNN.com. The Opening Call Newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the Opening Call Newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn. And he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters letters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, educating investors. Call now, toll free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we had a question from Z in the Den, just asking some of my thoughts on the uh, closed door talks uh, at the Senate about AI and its potential impact. Um, the first thing, at least on it, I, I suppose my opinion is I, I really wish um, that that there would have been a portion of it that was open committee um, that we could have listened to. I think this impact has, has like wide scale implications for all of us. Um, and I think even more so than past kind of emerging technological ages have had on the populations. Um, because this, this goes so exponential. You see, like, AI in some theories can, like, develop on itself and the implications it has for daily tech. I mean, eventually what you can end up having is that most people don't know how anything works, right? So you kind of create these large classes, different classes of citizens um, you know, and I, I, I bring it up too. Um, I was thinking one day, I've, I've told this story before, but I was thinking one day I was reading, um, or I saw like a short on YouTube, uh, about a tool that loggers use to move logs. And someone was saying, they, they quoted Archimedes, um, uh, you know, about fulcrums. And I was like, you know, this isn't a fulcrum, whatever. I was kind of thinking of like mechanical principles and stuff like that. And I started thinking, you know, when I was a kid, um, you know, we had like the, the seesaw, right? And that's like a fulcrum concept. And these, and just a bunch of different little, um, you know, I wouldn't want to say toys, but out, like outside activities and kind of in a way it conveyed mechanical principles on the younger generation, right? Through play and they would later learn, um, you know, the theories in class or something like that. But a lot of kids nowadays, I mean, these things still exist, but um, it's so tech heavy. But if you ask someone, you know, how an iPad actually works, like where is it getting data from? How is it storing the data? How does it show you these uh, images on it? Um, graphical user interface is so advanced now that, you know, common person can kind of utilize these really complex algorithms and stuff like that. Um, and I think that's worrisome in a lot of ways uh, because again, it just creates uh, two classes of citizens, ones that are very ignorant of how things work um, in the common world and, and tools that are used for everyday kind of operations. Um, and then obviously a group who, who know everything about it. And there's a, there's a power dynamic um, incongruency there, which I think is a problem. With AI, um, obviously this 
kind of compounds this risk quite heavily. And I would say a lot of people still don't even understand how um, like these language models work, right? Um, which I think is super necessary. Um, Elon Musk said, this is one of the famous bits of news to come out that uh, AI poses a civilizational risk if it is not regulated properly, which, you know, this is valid. I mean, we're seeing how AI uh, is being used in uh, warfare applications. It's already extremely advanced and, you know, we're just at the, the cusp of this. I mean, imagine when computing gets uh, even better than it is currently, um, you know, AI will be uh, it, like, I, you know, it's hard to kind of really articulate how um, insane it could be, I would suppose. I mean, I even saw something recently and this is I wouldn't even consider this truly AI, uh, but they developed um, like rifles and uh, you, you shoot these rifles and you can move it on the target and it and it hits it. The bullet itself will curve and make small minor adjustment adjustments. Uh, this is obviously quite a, a big force multiplier. And uh, again, I, I think it's that kind of power dynamic incongruency that occurs with stuff like that. So I think the takeaway that Congress had is there's going to need to be pretty tight um, legislative work with industry in order to one, make sure AI, there's opportunity for AI to be developed, but also being able to reel it in a little bit as well. Um, and, you know, just for the benefit of everyone. And so it doesn't get out of hand. Um, one of the other things that Elon said, and this is where you start getting into the more like the businessman aspect of things. Uh, he was kind of taking a jab at open AI saying, you know, the name open AI confers some kind of like idea about how they operate. And the idea was, that they had open source and everyone could see this AI, right? And this was supposed to be very equalizing where anyone could get access to the back end of this AI, <clears throat> see how it generates its answers, uh, know that there's no manipulation, whatever. And now with Microsoft coming in and investing such a large amount of money in open AI, Elon Musk said there's a threat that they could, um, you know, he suggested, he didn't outright say it, but there's a potential for there to be manipulation there. Um, and then also at any time, Microsoft can pull the plug on it. Now, this is coming from a guy who's also in the midst of making a language model AI that's going to compete with, with Microsoft and uh, Chat GPT-4. So, you know, you got to take that with a grain of salt. And he's always on that mode. So, anyways, I think it's good that they had this conversation. I really would have liked to see um, or, or, you know, at least have a recording and you could do... Um, you know, some communications and skiffs, like if it is sensitive for, uh, you know, national security or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's that's my two pence on that. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how we go forward. And really, as it stands now, I, the, the consumer end for AI is, is nothing compared to what they have um, on really high enterprise and, uh, you know, kind of military time with that. Um, that, they, that AI is kind of probably beyond a lot of comprehension for the average person. You know, just because we're not uh, used to that kind of stuff. I always take two, and I'm going to stop harping on this now because I know I'm just rambling at this point. But um, I always think about the story with what GPS was, right? And how the military had GPS um, for years prior to it moving to the consumer market. And then the GPS that we have currently um, is, you know, lagged a little bit to military data. So, you, you know, you think about that in a realm where um, computing has gotten so much more advanced, but more expensive. So only large entities can really afford that level of com uh, computation. And uh, yeah, you can, your mind can kind of wander with what kind of tech they really have. And it'll trickle out, you know, as it becomes either phased out or they get better things uh, and then they'll move into the consumer market. Anyways, kind of on the tech conversation, um, we were talking about how MGM Studios got uh, attacked by a cyber uh, ransomware group. And this is some, uh, just a little word of the wise, Caesars Entertainment ended up paying the ransom. So what happens is they lock all, they encrypt all your files and yet the, there's a button you can go and pay the ransom. And once that's confirmed on the blockchain, you get a key and that uh, decrypts all of the files. Um, you don't ever pay the ransom. That is the worst thing you could possibly do in any situation. Okay, so in this case, Caesars Entertainment were able to decrypt their files, which is fine. But there's, a, again, this famous story of before Russia invaded Ukraine, they launched a ransomware uh, virus called NotPetya, right? And it was the same concept. They were trying to make it look like it was not state actor, so it had the classic details of ransomware where it's like, okay, click here, pay me 10 Bitcoin or whatever, and we'll decrypt all your files. Well. 
in reality, there was no decryption key because it was something military. Um, and there was no, uh, you know, it wasn't just like a general um, criminal gang interested in, in getting money. And so you always run that risk when you're paying ransoms that there's actually not a decryption key. And this payment, in my opinion, was probably done a, a little bit due to ignorance on the part of some high-level execs at Caesars. Um, that's not said in this, but uh, that is that is the mode of operations. You don't pay them. And furthermore, when you end up paying something like this, what you're doing is putting a massive target on your back that, look, I can be extorted um, and I'll you know go along with what you're saying if you get in. And I'm sure it was not difficult for this group to really uh, put this ransomware on the computer. So anyways, that's an update on that. Uh, there's a lot of money lost in this as well. So folks, stay tuned. We will be right back. The Gold Report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the U.S. futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly gold report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African RAND, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at TFNN.com. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. For free, each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den. Hosted at Discord, TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den. Available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tiger's Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TFN. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, folks. Uh, taking a look at Chevron right now. They haven't been hit um, hard at all by this news, but it's still uh, somewhat interesting what's going on. There are uh, strikes at their LNG Australian plant. Um, so the Chevron Corp liquefied natural gas plant in Australia has reported a production outage Thursday as workers escalated to strike action against facilities that provide more than 5% of global LNG supplies. And at these facilities, 25% of 
um, output decrease has been seen due to these strikes. Uh, the U.S. energy giant said in a statement that it is working to resume full production at its Wheatstone facility following a fault which has impacted about 25% of LNG production. Uh, the cause has been identified and restart activities have commenced. Uh, Chevron's, uh -huh, Chevron's Wheatstone and Gorgon plants in Western Australia state account for more than 5% of global LNG. And that's a lot of leverage uh, for these uh, strikers. However, Chevron did not link the disruption uh, to an escalation Thursday in its strike at its Wheatstone and Gorgon LNG plants. Around 500 workers at the Chevron sites have been taking limited strike actions since, since September 8th. Hence this kind of, uh, you know, downward motion we hear. Uh, where are we at? Right here. This kind of sideways movement. Uh, regardless, they're saying it's not that. Um, and they'll probably resume production. Um, but pretty interesting news. Again, they haven't really been hit at all hard today. They're just kind of sideways. Uh, but we're seeing strikes go on um, a lot of places. And in that realm as well, we can talk um, about some of the jobless claims going on. So a lot of the issue that's happening is you had like rising wages. The Fed was trying to depress these wages and also increase unemployment in order to cool off the economy. This obviously can peeve off the smaller people. Um, and so you're seeing a lot of striking too for higher wage growth as inflation is raging. And it's such a weird, you know, double-edged sword, right? Because you depress wages and this really affects the common person. And you're depressing these wages at a time when prices of everything else are rising. So you get this pretty disgruntled kind of energy that occurs uh, from it. And uh, with this Associated Press article, uh, it says applications for U.S. jobless benefits have ticked up only slightly. Uh, so the number of Americans applying for unemployment benefits last week ticked up modestly after falling to the lowest level in seven months the week before, as companies continue to retain employees despite the Federal Reserve's efforts to cool the economy. U.S. applications for jobless claims rose by 3,000 to 220,000 for the week ending September 9th, the Labor Department reported Thursday. Jobless claim applications are seen as a representative of the number of layoffs in a given week, of course. The four-week moving average of claims is less volatile measure, fell by 5,000 uh, to 224,500. Uh, the Federal Reserve is well into the second year of its battle against inflation, having raised interest rates 11 times since March of last year. Uh, at 5.4%, the Fed's benchmark borrowing rate is at its highest level in 22 years. Uh, the Fed's rates hikes are meant to cool the job market and bring down wages, which many economists believe helps ease the pressure on price growth. Yeah, like I said, that's just a, it's just a tough spot for a lot of people. Yeah, because you're just making it in the inner, you know, in, in, in the short term, right? And on the short term, I mean, this could be like a few years. Uh, you make it actually more difficult for people to consume things. And uh, we are seeing that as uh, there was a poll that was developed and a lot of Americans think that uh, they're going to have to reel in their spending. There's this article, too, that we'll talk about just after this. Um, but, you know, childhood pov poverty and income decline is popping as well, um, especially after the coronavirus pandemic benefits ended. And I just, you know, I wonder, I was reading uh, this article, too, that the Bank of, uh, it was about the Bank of England and how uh, they admitted they had made a, a pretty big mistake in increasing the money supply as much as they did. And um, in some capacity, they're saying that has to do, um, at least with inflation, in some capacity. Um, and, you know, a lot of spending uh, is done by larger corporations and stuff like that. And it just seems uh, that smaller people can get hit a lot with that, right? It's kind of hard to blame, like, your average American consumer uh, for the level of inflation that's occurring, especially when they're just trying to secure a job, have a job, and, uh, you know, make more money can't really fault people for that, but that is the nature of things currently. Um, so we'll see how that develops out. Let's see if I can pull this up. I can just click it here. I had this article, I was going to speak about it yesterday, but I just, I ran out of time. Um, but again, looking at like how the average American consumer is doing, um, you know, versus the stock market or anything like that. Uh, this Associated Press article is saying that child poverty in the U.S. jumped and income declined in 2022 as coronavirus pandemic benefits ended. Uh, so all at the same time, the official poverty rate um, for black Americans dropped to its lowest level on record and in income inequality declined for the first time since 2007, which is great um, when looking at pre-tax income. However, the income inequality increased when using after-tax income, which is another result of the end of pandemic era tax credits, according to the Census Bureau reports on income. 
The reports reflected at sometimes conflicting factors last year buffeting uh, U.S. households. Uh, workers face a robust job market, and uh, with the number of full-time employees increasing year over year, the share of women working full-time year-round reaching an all-time high, and an increase in income for households run by someone with no high school diploma. Uh, but they also face rising inflation uh, at the end of the uh, pandemic Emma, excuse me, and the end of the pandemic era stimulus benefits. It's interesting too, though. You know, I I speak with um I have some friends who are in you know like fabrication uh, and welding and stuff like that, and I know I was bringing up one uh, who worked for a uh, company that uh, they 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 keep uh, methane under high pressures in these containers, and he uh, welds for them. And you know they they can't get enough people. They uh, need to hire more. They're pushing out their kind of complete dates by years at this point. Um, and so it's just this: we have this strange hodgepodge of everything going on in the economy right now. And it's like, how does it end? Is something as simple as trying to depress wages and uh, you know increase unemployment is that you know the most? How do you say like? I suppose efficient way of doing it is this like the actual correct way of doing it. I, I know from taking a lot of economics courses that it's you know these equations are very simple and stuff like that. Uh, but the world is always so much more complex, and so I wonder going forward we'll see a revision of how um, you know the Fed kind of deals with inflation. And obviously I don't think that's going to be anytime soon uh, whatsoever. Um, but I think the world is so vastly different now, um, and with the rise of. Uh, you know, really of globalism and trade in like a major way. Um, we're, we're really seeing an increase in that, even though we have since, you know, the 80s, it's been really solidified as pretty standard. Um, and uh, just demand for things is very high. So, you know, we'll see how that goes. It, but we were also talking about how factory input, or excuse me, output is decreasing and really for reasons like this as well as uh, some decreased demand from China. Anyways, interesting to kind of muse about uh, some new news as well. A new IPO valuation will be Birkenstock. That's coming out of Germany. That's an $8 billion valuation. Uh, I I don't know what to think about this. I'll have to look a little bit more. And I mean, I wear Birkenstocks. I'm wearing them right now. I think they're like very comfortable shoes. But I always get a little bit nervous about uh, companies that have really just kind of one line of, uh, <laughs> I guess, of products, right? I mean, you look at Nike. Obviously, they're very well known for their shoes. But they've really become a standard apparel company uh, overall, right? Uh, they have so many different lines of products and Birkenstocks, you know, they're, they're great with their designs, but I don't know. I just, these kind of uh, stocks options never really interest me, but we'll talk just a little bit more about that uh, when we get back. And folks, stay tuned for that. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. 
Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Are China A shares hot or not? If you trade China A shares, now may be time to take a closer look. Trade CHAU or CHAD, Directions Daily CSI 300 China A share bull and bear ETFs. China A shares in either direction. Visit directioninvestments.com today. An investor should consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of the Direction shares carefully before investing. The prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about Direction shares. To obtain a prospectus or summary prospectus, please contact Direction shares at 866-476-7523. The prospectus or summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. Welcome back, folks. Uh, before we went to the break, we were just talking about Birkenstock is filing for an IPO. Uh, they, if that's accepted, they'll be joining uh, the NYSE in early October. And so this is kind of the figures uh, they had been releasing. It's uh, the revenues for the six months ending in March 31st showed a net growth of 19%, uh, rising to approximately 692.8 million um, from around 543 million during the same period last year. Uh, however, the company's net profit uh, fell to around 40 million, a 45.3% drop from 73 million in the previous year. Obviously, there's a lot of factors that go into um, the impact uh, from COVID era times, and uh, there's still conversation about future outbreaks and all these, um, you know, global instability and stuff like that. Uh, just, you know, a bunch of fun topics. You know, this is just a way for them probably not to have to pull on more debt in order to kind of meet. Um, kind of the standards they have or like orders. So it'll be interesting. I, I think if this does come out, I don't, obviously this is probably not a high growth stock at all, especially for really like one major line of product, um, but it might hold its value pretty well. Um, we'll take a look. I, none of the data is up for ARM right now. Um, and I wanted to look through it and kind of go through how IPOs usually work <laughs> because and it's, this is again, this is another, we ha I had a unit on this in one of my investment courses, but I mean, you know, you don't need college to, to know any of this. We always see these really wild movements with IPOs. Obviously, it starts, it runs all the way up, uh, then there's a big sell-off, and you kind of get this uh, stabilization price for quite a while until uh, some new news comes out from it. Right, give me one moment. So, yeah, we'll talk just a little bit more about ARM, um, just some more specifics on it. It had the initial value of uh, $4.5 billion for its IPO, um, it's priced at 95.5 million shares at 51 apiece, which is the high end of its expected range of 45 to 51. Uh, the IPO raised nearly $5 billion uh, for majority owner SoftBank, which is pretty intense, and they own 90% of ARM stock. Uh, now, this is strange as well because NVIDIA offered to, to purchase ARMS last year, and the valuation uh, of its IPO is 36% higher than what NVIDIA had offered. Uh, and also the revenue dipped uh, last year as well, or excuse me, um, in its, fi uh, ah, I can't speak, in its fiscal 2023 uh, ending March 31st. And that's from weak smartphone sales. So, it, you know, it stands to see what this is like. Uh, well, there's been a lot of talk that this valuation might be a little too high. And as we, like I said, as we usually see with IPOs, you get this huge price run up because of the hype and then people trying to fight uh, for that sell out. Um, so we might get some kind of situation in around that 45, that lower end of uh, the analysis. So we'll see. I can't wait for that data to come out, and I'm not really sure why it's not pulling still. Um, regardless, we'll talk here about Tesla. So this is uh, pretty interesting news here. They have these gigafactories, which are massive, like one-stop shops for everything, and they work on a bunch of different um, kind of components of these kind of smart cars almost. 
Uh, Tesla has combined a series of innovations to make a technological breakthrough that could transform the way it makes electric vehicles and uh, help Elon Musk achieve his aim of having production costs. Uh, the company pioneered the use of huge presses with 6,000 and 9,000 tons of clamping pressure to mold the front and rear structures of its Model Y in a, quote, in a, quote, giga casting process right on that slashed production costs and left rivals scrambling to catch up. In a bid to extend its lead, Tesla is closing in on an innovation that would allow it to die cast nearly all complex underbody of the EV into one piece. That would be really huge. And if you've never seen these die casts, you should check them out. It's the like fabrication process just for these like random little bits that you don't even think about that maybe go on your like lawn mowers and all these kind of deals. They, you know, they use die casting um, and they're just these large singular molds, very expensive IP as well. They keep these kind of designs very top secret. Uh, which I think is pretty neat. Uh, so die casting the entire, you know, how does it say? The, the underbody of the EV in one piece is pretty nuts. Uh, and then, yeah, rather than about 400 parts in a conventional car, that would obviously increase uh, output uh, substantially. Uh, the know-how is core to Tesla's unboxed manufacturing strategy unveiled by chief executive uh, Musk in March. I think is neat. And, and really, you know, I think that... You know, Elon Musk obviously lives in people's heads rent free and everything, but yeah, he does have a lot of interesting solutions, especially with like some extraction from lithium. He wanted to be more in charge of that. I, I like his idea, uh, at least for Tesla, of kind of having the whole supply chain um, if he doesn't control all of it, but at least have his hands in a lot of it. And he came up with some novel ideas for um, getting lithium, right? That would be a little bit cheaper as well. And I spoke about that, I think, last year. So anyways, I think this is really neat. The 3D printing, and this is neat as well. Uh, there's another car company, I forget the name of it, but they are using generative AI to design lighter weight and more efficient um, components within the car. Uh, so the engine itself, actually, let me see if I can just pull it up. Um, let me see here. And it's so weird because the human mind is, you know, obsessed with ideas of like symmetry and everything like that. Um, okay, here you go. Is this right? Yeah, the Zinger 21. So this design for the internal, this is like a supercar, of course, um, but this was designed using generative AI. Um, and you use less materials, and essentially it's much stronger as well. This kind of design is more efficient. I just think that's pretty neat. And going forward, I mean, what a, what, what like a just fantastic concept, I think. Anyways, this is the cool thing with AI, right? Like it pushes the kind of more instinctual limits or the limits that instincts impose on humans. It kind of like gets us out of that, which I think is is pretty neat. So if this die casting works, I would love to see how that works. But I, I again think that will probably be kept under a pretty strict control on a need to know basis, really. We were talking a little bit about shrinkage and how a lot of retailers were blaming uh, theft essentially on cuts into revenue. Then this article we came through was saying uh, these quarter, this quarterly release around uh, was just referring to shrinkage. And what that has to do with is it could be administrative errors. It does include shoplifting, um, but it can also include damaged products and so on. And so this article here is saying that retailers are losing $100 billion a year from return fraud, bots, and coupon stacking. And that's not really theft. I mean, return fraud is theft in, uh, you know, obviously a legal way, but it's not, you know, running in, breaking cases, and taking everything. Now, the key points on this is the anti-fraud company Risk Field pulled 300 global companies and found losses for policy abuses, and this is administrative issues, really, at the end of the day, um, such as uh, return fraud and coupon stacking are costing retailers $100 billion annually. Uh, in one case, just 4,000 users created 137,000 fake accounts to take advantage of a discount code. Wow. Uh, again, guys, uh, smart IT. you got to have smart coding practices there. Uh, resulting in $14 million in annual losses, uh, one survey respondent said they would rather have a customer break into their warehouse and steal an item than order it and return it because the returns process is so long and costly. Uh, for the last three years, uh, this individual named Robert had used a different email address to take advantage of a Black Friday Hulu promotion that most recently offered new customers a year-long subscription for just $1.99 a month instead of $7.99 monthly cost. Yeah, and a lot of times it's as simple as that. I mean, wow, right? And what a gross oversight. Um, administratively speaking. Folks, stay tuned. We will be right back.
If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. Welcome back, folks. Uh, we are at the end of this show. We have about two and a half minutes left, so we'll talk a little bit. Uh, this isn't a scientific article or anything like that, but it kind of ties in a little bit, and it's also funny, the end point of it. So this is the shipping giant Maersk unveils world's first vessel using green methanol. Interesting. The new container ship ordered in 2021 has two engines, one moved by the traditional fuels and another run with green methanol, an alternative component which uses biomass or captured carbon and hydrogen from renewable power. Uh, the new vessel emits 100 tons of carbon dioxide less per day compared to diesel-based ships. Interesting. Um, so yeah, there's you know a big movement towards, ah, just also reminded me as well from that, um, that Apple kind of public announcement um, that they're no longer shipping with air, they're, they're using uh, C now because it's apparently greener. Um, but on this point, I, there is uh, these discussions going around about ships instead using what they're calling high-tech rigid sails. And so time is really a flat circle and we're getting back to the age of sails if this uh, cuts through. There's just a retick again in interest in it. But seeing the ideas of uh, what they're again calling high-tech rigid sails uh, is hilarious. And uh, maybe we'll get uh, some cool letter of marks from that and the, the age of piracy will come back or something. But uh, interesting nonetheless, uh, with this green methanol, um, obviously this output is far superior uh, than just burning traditional fuels. Shipping accounts for around 3% of global carbon emissions, an amount comparable to major polluting countries. However, decarbonization, excuse me, decarbonizing the sector has been challenging. Uh, Denmark's Minister of Industry, Morten Botskov, said this is because uh, it is a global industry. This is interesting, too, because I was just talking about um, 
that virus that the Russians released on Ukraine, not Petya, and Maersk actually got affected by this, if I recall correctly. Um, and they had, uh, anyways, that's kind of irrelevant, but I thought it was interesting that this story involved Maersk as well. Around 90% of traded goods in the world are carried via ocean shipping, according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So folks, focus on, let's manifest the age of sales again. I think that would be uh, phenomenal, not for the environment, uh, but for life's lore as well. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, we have Larry up at 1 p.m. and then Tom will bring us home uh, at 3 p.m. Thank you so much.